Hey, good morning, everybody. What's up? This is Trey Griggs of Beta Consulting Group for another episode of Standing Out, a daily podcast about sales, marketing, and leadership powered by Beta Consulting Group. Do us a favor, jump over to betaconsultinggroup.com and see how we can help you with your sales and marketing strategies, particularly your branding, your messaging, your content creation, social media engagement, podcasts, whatever it might be. Coming to you today from the big island of Hawaii. That's why the sun's just not coming up for me and the rest of you have been up for several hours. I uh, hope you're having a fabulous Monday, getting your day started off right. Also, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Tafts. These are the good guys in freight factoring. They're helping carriers to have all the resources they need to thrive in any market, including fuel discounts and tire discounts and insurance uh, discounts and everything else that they need. So if you're an asset-based carrier, make sure that you check them out and see how they can benefit you. If you're a freight broker, you can become a referral partner and make sure that your carriers have great resources from a company that's truly working to educate and, uh, and help them be successful in any market. Check them out at TAFS.com. Be sure to click on the link in the comments today. Um, that's going to be really beneficial because then it goes directly to my home, my page and let them know that I sent you. Uh, find out more about how they can help you out and benefit you, uh, you know, today. All right, we got a great week of shows this week. Very excited to be coming from Hawaii every week. And this week, my good friend Beth Carroll is going to be on today. We're going to bring her on in a minute. This, um, this crazy guy, Joshua Harrison, who I met, who is, um, he's an extreme endurance athlete. We're going to be talking about his upcoming 100 mile run. He's raising money for incredible causes, and he's got a couple of incredible adventures coming up. We're going to talk about the mindset it takes to do that kind of work. On Wednesday, my good friend, Blythe Brumley, who kicked off this entire podcast three months ago with me. She's going to be back on. We're going to be talking about the TMSA conference coming up and all things marketing. She is a genius, a guru, so can't wait to have her on. On Thursday, my good friend Curtis Triber of Exo Freight, EXO Freight, is going to be on. This guy's a genius when it comes to technology and transportation and growing a company. They're doing some awesome things there. And then on Friday, my good friend Sarah Barnes-Humphrey, who's the founder of Let's Talk Supply Chain, uh, who's just an incredible entrepreneur and a great, uh, a great presence, a great voice. Um, in the industry. She's going to be on on Friday to uh, end the week, which is going to be tremendous. So make sure you come back every day, 1030 a.m. Central Time, right here on LinkedIn Live or Facebook. I'm sorry, or uh, YouTube or Twitter. We're not on Facebook just yet, but maybe soon. All right, everybody, let's bring on today's guest. This woman is phenomenal in our industry of transportation. And if you've ever tried to create a compensation plan in freight, you've probably heard her name, read her book, or had a conversation with her. She's absolutely wonderful to talk to. And I'm so excited to have her on the show today. Everybody give it up for my good friend, Beth Carroll. Hey, Beth, how are you? Hi, Trey. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so great to talk to you. Good to see you. We got to see you at the recent TIA conference just about a month ago in San Diego, which was an awesome show. Was that was that your first show back or have you been to some other trade shows? Um, been to some smaller yeah. things like some insurance captive groups had me speaking and a couple small things for TCA, but that was the first really big one since the pandemic. Yeah, I know. 1,500 people. Energy was yeah. great. It was just awesome to be with people and, and to talk again. Now, it's been a long time since we met, but before we talk about that, give everybody who may not know, I mean, most people know who you are, Beth, but for people who may not know who you are, give everybody the 15 second rundown of who Beth Carroll is and what you're focused on. Yep. Well, basically, I'm the um, founder and owner of Prosperio Group. We are a compensation consulting firm that helps companies figure out how to do performance-based pay, incentive pay, that sort of thing. So I've got 24 years experience doing this. I started with a big HR consulting firm, um, you know, flying around all over the country, doing like the Monday to Thursday kind of gig uh, in Salesforce Rewards, did that for 10 years, and then always had an entrepreneurial bent, wanted to start my own company. And it just was, it happened to be the most amazing coincidence that at the time that I parted ways very amicably with Towers Perrin, which of course is now Willis Towers Watson, that I happened to be working with CRST Logistics at the time. So they became my first transportation client, freight broker. Um, and then they got me introduced into the TIA and that kind of started the ball rolling so that now um, since 2008, I've worked with over 300 transportation and logistics companies. So freight brokers is a big chunk of it, but I also work with asset-based providers, warehouses, 3PL supply chain, pretty much any, anything that's in the supply chain space, I consider to be like my market. And you, um, you also wrote a book. Um, talk a little bit about that book and where people can find that real quick. I don't want to forget this. Yeah, sure. It's called Taming the Compensation Monster, and you can get it on Amazon. It exists in like regular uh, paperback, ebook, and audio book. That's not me reading the audio book. Oh, you didn't so. read it? Oh, I always love it when the author reads. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't me. Um, 
And I just, I wrote it because I felt like I had done all these articles for the TIA, the journal, and it really kind of was like, a, I could put it into a book. I could give everybody like a step-by-step -step, step instruction manual on how to do incentive compensation. So there's really a lot to it. People don't understand. They think, oh, it's just figuring out what the commission rate should be, but it really is a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. And we met, I think it was probably a TI uh, back in the day, maybe 2017, 2016, somewhere along those lines. So I've heard your name for a long time and knew that, you know, if it came to compensation, you were the expert to go to, to figure that out. When you think about compensation, and this is a struggle for, you know, a lot of companies, but when you think about compensation, you know, what are some of the, 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 the critical components to that? Well, but before I ask that question, let me ask this, how many positions in a company should be um, the compensation should be more uh, like incentive or behavior driven. Like when you think about that, like yep. how would you describe that to a company? Actually, there's a really good way to think about it. So you want to think about like your sales and operations staff are going to be the ones that are going to be incentive heavy. Your back office staff could have some incentive compensation, but it's going to be lighter for them because there's just less things that you can measure on an individual basis. So any role that you're tracking, you know, daily, weekly, monthly KPIs on and you feel like you've got something you can use quantifiably, those are going to be the roles that you're going to go after for incentive compensation. Of course, leadership has its own brand of compensation as well. And if it's like a publicly traded company, then it's exec comp, which is something different than what I do. But really, I would start with any role that's in sales and operations. And you can have those roles be on a more individualized incentive compensation plan. And if you're an asset based company, there's a lot of roles that actually fit in there. So like driver, manager, load planner, customer service rep. Um, I've even done plans for like mechanics. So it really it just depends on what can you track. Yeah. And, and what kind of led you to that? You know, when you think about your career, what led you to realize, hey, this is a this is a real issue that companies have. And this is an issue that I can solve. It was just happenstance. I mean, I, I have an MBA from Northwestern. And when I got through with that program, that's when I got recruited into towers to, to be in their strategy and org practice and then in their Salesforce rewards practice. So I did this for 10 years for sales. Right. So think about manufacturing sales, banking. Um, insurance, anybody that has a big sales force, traditional, you know, like territory sales, that kind of stuff. Um, I had no idea that there was a market for this in freight, right? No clue whatsoever. In fact, I almost didn't go to the first TIA show that I went to in 2009 because um, Cindy, love Cindy to death, but Cindy being Cindy, made me pay the $600 registration fee to go and speak <laughs> at the conference. And I thought, I'm going to show up for, you know, a 45 minute panel presentation and then I'm leaving. Why? I don't even know if there's a market here for me. You know, it's like I have one client in this space. What are these freight brokers? What do they want? Um, right. And so I went and I did that. Luckily, thank God I said yes. Um, and I went down and I signed up my second client, like right after the presentation at lunch, uh, JH Rose was my second one. And then third one came soon thereafter. And it just sort of has snowballed since then. But it became pretty obvious to me that this was a need, right? So that this industry needed this help and they didn't have anybody giving them any sort of guidance about how to do this. So it was always just, well, I, you know, we figured this out. We wrote it up on the back of a napkin. We just figured out, you know, 25% <laughs> commission and, and, and nobody really knew, especially now how to adapt to the changing roles because technology is really changing this industry. And so the roles like account manager, so you've still got your traditional um, in the split model, you've got your traditional sales role, customer sales and carrier sales. But now there's sort of this in between role that's account management that's really taking over these bigger relationships. That one seems to be a real problem for people. And everyone's just punting. Like I've talked to 10 clients recently. Oh, we just pay them one percent of gross margin. We have no idea what we're supposed to do. I'll tell you right now, that's a mistake, um, because then when you are handing them accounts, because that's typically what happens in this role, you're Santa Claus. Right. Whoever gets a big account and is getting one percent off of that, you just gave them a gift. You're set. They didn't, right. right. They didn't do anything for that. And what you really want them to do is to take that account as given and grow it. So you want to use goal based incentives for that role in particular. Some other roles, it, it's still OK to do sort of hybrid commission type plans. But for account management, we got to get away from just doing a straight commission. 
Yeah. And before we go any further about compensation, I think there's also something there that's really worth noting. And that is, you know, it's really good to never skip an opportunity or a meeting. You know, like you said, you almost didn't go to TIA, but <laughs> yeah. you did. And then that changed a lot of things. And so oh, I think that there's changed a lot the of entire about trajectory that. of my career. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So anytime I get a chance to meet somebody, there's part of me that was like, if I can make this work, I should, because you just never know you what's going to come out of a meeting. And so I've done a lot that didn't amount to anything or didn't amount to anything for years. Right. So like I will go to something yeah. and five years later, somebody will say, I met you at that show, you know, five <laughs> years ago, and now it's the time to hire you. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm glad I did that. Yeah, I would have thought yeah. it was a waste, but it wasn't. So. Well, and also it goes to your brand, right? Like you've become well known in the industry and it's your brand where people, when they need the help, who do they think of? And this is something that we talk about with our clients all the time. Wouldn't you like to be the at the top of the list of someone's mind when they realize that they need your services? And that's what brand really is. And you've done a great job of promoting that. You have your book, of course, and uh, you know your the word of mouth from the clients that you have, of course, is a big, a big factor as well. So let's jump back into compensation for just a moment, because I think this is so important, especially within sales roles. When you get a sales compensation plan correct it is gold i mean it mm -hmm. creates the behaviors that you want and if you're not getting the behaviors that you want as a sales leader it's most likely because your comp plan is not set up correctly would you agree with that statement or how would you assess somebody yeah. in that regard I, I wish it were all about comp i really do because then i could charge a heck of a lot more for my <laughs> um it's usually a combination of factors right so comp will be a piece of it yes but if you've got crappy managers if you have bad training um if you're if your culture is toxic, then no amount of perfect compensation plan is going to change that kind of stuff. Right. So what I always look for is yeah. do you have good, is your org structure clear? Is your, are your roles clear? Do people know like the lane that they are supposed to play in? Do you have good tracking and reporting? Do, are they trained? Do they have the ability to do what it is you're asking to do them to do? And do they have good management support and underneath support? So like track and trace order entry, that kind of stuff. If you've got all that in place, then yes, putting in, improving your compensation plan can make a huge difference. But the other thing to keep in mind is there's no, there's no perfect compensation plan. And it, what you may have that works really well right now probably will not work five years from now. And so compensation is one of the biggest, if not the biggest expense that most of these companies <clears throat> have. And you have to always be thinking of it as a strategic investment. And just like you evaluate your TMS system, is this still working for our needs? You have to be doing that with your incentive compensation plan as well to make sure that it's keeping up with what you want to do. It should always be tested to make sure, is it aligning with our, our goals and objectives as an organization, supporting our sales strategy, supporting our roles, keeping up with changes in technology? That's a huge thing because people are processing more loads than they ever have been able to in the past because of like... AI and stuff that's helping them do it. Companies are coming to grips with the fact that the, you know, the old commission, 25% commission plan that they used to do or whatever, pick a number, um, isn't going to work in that model anymore because their pay is just, the reps pay is just going to continue to increase without the company being able to recoup any of their investment and all this stuff that made it easier for the rep to now do 25 loads a day when it used to be eight. So I love this. We, we only have 30 minutes to talk. I, I can talk about this for an hour with you. I love hearing you talk about it. So when you come to a company, to a client that you're working with, it's really a holistic perspective that you have. It's not just the compensation, of course. It's the leadership. It's the structure. It's the training. Um, it's all those things that are included. Talk a little bit about, you know, because a lot of times people will get a compensation plan wrong from the beginning and it could be wrong on either end. It could be like it's not a good comp plan and people realize I don't, I'm not going to make anything here and I'm out. Or it could be something where it's like you said, too generous. Mm -hmm. How do you help companies navigate a too generous plan or <laughs> a plan that works today? It's not going to work in five years because right. sales guys don't want their compensation plan, no, especially don't. if it's a good plan. They don't right. want it touched when they're making a whole lot of money. So that's usually one of the questions I ask is how much do your top earners make? Because that gives me an idea of what the change management is going to be like. And when you start to get people over 200,000, they're going to get really dug in to the lifestyle and the expectation that they have about that comp plan. So it does get really hard to change it, even if and I and generally my approach to this is we're not trying to take money away from anybody. We're just trying to change the methodology because like that, I would say the number one complaint that I get on the customer sales side is they're not going after new customers anymore. 
They've built right. up their existing book of business. They're sort of fat and happy living on this existing book of business. And we don't mind paying them a lot of money, but we really need new customers, right? We need them to not just right. be like sitting on this nest. We need them to be going out and hunting. And so the intention of a good sales compensation plan is it should pay top performers more and it should pay underperformers less. That's what you want to do when you change the compensation plan. It may be a different definition of what a good performer is, right? So it used to be I was a top performer because I built a really big book of business. The new definition is I'm a top performer because I'm getting on, you know, I'm adding on, you know, 10, 15, 20 new customers a year. That makes me a top performer. So doing that top performance in a new plan should make you just as much money or more than the old plan. It's just changing the definition of what good is, what good looks like. So one of the key things is in any plan that you're putting together, you need to have um, some a lever that you can change. And if you're paying a straight commission rate, there's no lever to change, right? The right. only choice you have is to lower the commission rate or at taxes, overhead fees, charges for support resources, right? You're doing this dance that everybody knows what you're doing. So you can say, oh, well, we're still paying a 25% commission. No, you're not. By the time you take all that stuff out of it, if it's a draw plan, if it's, you might be down around 10 to 12% by the time you actually do the math on it. And so what we would rather do is just be upfront about it. Like, look, your goals are going to change. We're going to, the business is going to change. The business model is going to change. Our expectations of you are going to change. We still want you to make top dollar, but that probably means you're going to need to produce more on a year over year basis to continue to make that much money. There's no company in the world that is rewarded by Wall, by Wall Street for stagnancy, if that's even a word, for being stagnant, right? <laughs> Stagnation, maybe. Stagnation. There we go. There you go. Um, <laughs> I'm an English major. I can make up words. Um, so, <laughs> like you know, you don't get rewarded for that. So I don't really understand why salespeople think they should be right. It's like, why is it OK to not grow? And you think that's OK. It shouldn't be right. Growth is a part of the job. Right. Yeah. And it is the beginning and you understand that, but it does change a lot of times. Right. If they get to like change. this plateau. Right. They get to that's a right. plateau and they're like, OK, I just kind of want to sit here and milk this. And it's like, well, that's it's actually not good for them and it's not good for the company. <clears throat> and some of those changes occur like in, the, in what you're asking them to do, like you said, because at the beginning of time when you're selling, a lot of times you're, you're managing accounts that you sell. And then, mm -hmm. as you said, once you get enough accounts, if you're if you're still asking being asked to manage those accounts, it is hard to sell. And so right. it's also changing the priority. Like, OK, well, I'm not going to manage accounts anymore. I'm just going to sell. Yes, that's right. That's what we need you to do. Yeah. We, we've got <laughs> the support now to manage the accounts. Right. We didn't have it at the beginning. So we paid you for that. And now we're not going to pay you for that because you're not going to do that. So I think it's being clear on on what those what those ex expectations are. What is like a reasonable like, well, maybe this is a maybe it's a loaded question. And I apologize if it is. But what's a reasonable expectation for turnover? when a company changes their compensation structure, because mm -hmm. you're not going to please everybody. No, it's very you're going to have, I think I'd say maybe five to 10%, maybe. If you get it right, and, if you and get it wrong, it could be much higher. <laughs> it, well, it depends, right? So you gave two scenarios. Sometimes there's companies that don't have a lot in the way of incentive compensation right now. I love doing those projects because they're easy. Right. Because we're not going to reduce the base salaries. That's my first law. Right. Do not reduce somebody's base salary. You're not going to take somebody's salary down to make room for the incentive comp. So in that world, we're just adding incentive comp on, on top of it. So it's it's rare that you lose people in that model. Um, it's also actually more rare to lose people when you're doing the other change, because if somebody's really radically overpaid, they know it. Right. And they're not going to be able to just take their book of business and, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole non-compete thing, but they, even if, you know, it's completely free and they can go do whatever, some of those customers have, you know, high change costs and they're not going to want to leave the company that they've gotten used to dealing with. They're not as attached to the sales rep as the sales rep likely thinks they are. Um, so they're not going to be able to take it and go and re replicate that someplace else. So even then, companies I have found don't lose nearly as many people as they are afraid they are going to when they sort of right size their plans and get them aligned with their strategy. There will be people who will leave no matter what. Right. And chances are this is just the, the final straw that they were on the edge to begin with. They didn't like their manager. They didn't like whatever. And OK, you're changing my comp plan. OK, I'm out of here. Right. But they were going to go the next time you painted the walls a different color. I mean, it's just, 
they just right. don't want to go. And interestingly enough, I've had people get upset even in the first scenario where all we're doing is adding incentive comp on. And it's like you yeah. think, you're, well, we're just going to pay you more money. But there are people out there that don't want to be tracked. Right. Yeah. So they want to just be left alone, do my job. I like having my salary. Don't start. Which really know, isn't a salesperson. More like no, that's, that's not somebody not a who's a salesperson. Yeah, that's not a salesperson. Yeah, any but salesperson that says they don't care about money is usually not not being for They're in the wrong that. role. Yeah, <laughs> no, right. that's usually you're going to hear that more in like your account management type function or your order entry, you know, that kind of stuff where they just sort of like doing the, you know, day in, day out, same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody's cut out for it and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But certainly when you get the compensation plan, correct, I think you, you kind of separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say, in terms mm -hmm. of figuring out who, who really wants this and who doesn't, if you, I always had the mindset that if you gave a top performer a really great incentive plan with everything else being equal, all things good, you know, in terms of leadership and structure and all that, but you give a top performer a great in, in sales incentive plan, they're going to get excited about it and they're going to go after it. And that's where you yep. can really figure out, okay, who, who, are the, who are my, my A players here? Um, and how can I replicate that as much as possible? So, and that's, that's good. another thing that's wrong with a straight commission plan, by the way, is there's no definition of what management expects. You completely leave it up to the individual to sort of back into how much money they want to make. So they'll take their desired earnings level, divide it by the commission rate, and then that tells them how much money or how much they need to sell. That may or may not work for what the company wants them to do. But truly good salespeople, like you said, Trey, truly good salespeople, they will, if you give them a goal, they'll crush that goal, right? And then you yeah. give them another goal, they crush that goal. And then you give them another goal and they crush that goal. So a lot of these straight commission plans aren't giving anybody a goal, right? Yeah. It's, there, yeah. There's no line. There's nothing that says, hey, I, I, I won. I, I beat right. it. Right. The rules are not it. clearly defined. Yeah. yeah. They want to have that defined. What does good look like? Yeah. Tell me about accelerators. So um, I, I, I've had several sales comp plans in my career. And one of those uh, had an accelerator, which was, you know, here's your goal. But then if you got 10% above your goal, we actually increased the percentage we're going to pay you. Yep. Tell me about accelerators. Do you like those? Do you not like those? How do you incorporate those? I use them a lot, right? So basically you want to have three marker points in your plan at a minimum, three marker points. You want threshold, which is the point below which no pay is earned. You want target where you get your target incentive pay. Some company, some sales comp consultants refer to that as OTE on target earnings. Mm -hmm. I call it TIC, target incentive comp. And then you should have like an excellence point. Okay. And that's where like your 10% of your people land. And it does, I'm not saying it's necessarily capped after that point, it can continue uncapped, but you need that marker point. So you know how to change that rate of acceleration. And I absolutely agree in, in having accelerators so that you have, you know, it's sort of a, a modest slope up to target, and then it accelerates above target. And then depending on the situation you're in, you can either accelerate some more or right. you decelerate, depending on if you're using like a goal based incentive plan might actually have some deceleration in there because your goals are probably not going to be perfect. And there's going to be situations like hurricanes and things like that, that really like sort of dump a bunch of stuff on people. Yeah, so, depends on the role. Right. So for account management, I would probably do more of like an uncapped but decelerated type plan because it's going to be goal based for customer sales. I would probably have it be just an increasing acceleration. But yeah. you've got to make sure that the overall economics work. And so you had asked if there's like one nugget I want to get. This is it. <laughs> um, so if you figure out, it, this is for freight brokers, standard truckload freight brokers. Um, if you take a couple numbers, you can really, you can figure out what your cost of compensation should be as a percentage of your gross margin pretty quickly. So take your um, desired net income percentage, which is a percentage of revenue. Typically, that's going to be a number like 5%. Okay. Then take your gross margin percentage, which for years and years and years has been like 15%. Right now it's changed a little bit, but I'm going to use 15 because it's easy. So 15% is the desired gross, gross margin percentage, which is of revenue, right? So you know you want 5% of revenue to be your net income. Well, that's one third of your 15, right? So you've just taken five off of that. So what you've got left is 66% of your gross of your gross margin that you've got to use to cover all of your other expenses, right? So your operating expenses, your payroll, all of that kind of stuff. Typically, if you cut that number in half, 
Okay. Cut that number in half and half of it's got to go to your TMS, your rent, your utilities, all that kind of stuff. The other half is what's left over for you to pay your W-2 pay. So if you followed my math right now, we're at about 33% of your margin. Okay. So 33% of your gross margin and give or take, it doesn't, it's not exactly going to be that number, but that's about what you've got available to cover all of your W-2 compensation costs. So that's salaries, incentives, bonuses for all of your staff, including IT, HR, marketing, accounting, leaders, everybody. Okay. So if you think about if you're paying a sales rep, a 30% commission, Okay, now I'm assuming they have a draw and all that kind of stuff. So their personal total cost of compensation is 30%. Where are you getting leverage to pay the people that aren't producers? It doesn't right. exist. And everybody knows that beginning people cost more than 100%. They're not covering their costs, right? So it's just simply, if that's your math, right? And have, people have different math. So do your math on it and figure out what you have available of your gross margin to cover your cost of compensation. Your sales commission plan at the top end of that can't be at the top, right? It just can't because you're not going to have enough money to pay all of your back office support people and to cover your newbies who aren't covering their costs. Yeah, I love that. And it's just a math equation that just has mm -hmm. to be worked out. And you yep. help you help companies along figuring that, that math equation out, which makes a lot of sense. I love accelerators because if you hit a goal as a top performer and there's not maybe another target to chase sometimes it's just nice to have that next target like okay yeah. i knocked this one off what's the next one what's the next one and i always enjoy that especially if i got off to a really good start in the month because if you got off to a really good start in the month um and you hit your goal you might be a, like somebody just keeps going but you also just might be like eh, okay I'm, i've already hit my goal but man if there's if there's more opportunity and you're a competitive person and i always just got fired up about that so well what i, I always tell people is there's a reason like all the loyalty programs like united and car programs, hotel programs, all that kind of stuff. Like they've got five or six levels and there's actually a good um, episode of Frasier. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but where they're like trying to get the upgrades. Frasier back in the day? Yeah, Frasier. Oh back yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, upgrades on the spas and stuff. And so it's like people always chased out for the upgrades and the next level and the next level. Like you want to get to gold status and platinum status and titanium That's right, something status. something in your mind, whatever. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you want to you want to build that kind of stuff into your compensation plan. And you can also do it with a mix of things. So you also want to have career progression. So you want to have like sales rep one, two and three, call them something better than that. But the idea is junior, intermediate, senior sales so that people can feel that they're progressing. They now have a higher status right. just yeah, in their yeah. title. Right. Yeah. Yep. I heard that a long time ago that in leadership, you know, for people to stick stick around, they need to be learning, they need to be getting promoted, and they need to be making money, and they have to have at least two out of those three. Yeah. So if they're making money and getting a promotion, even if maybe their educational aspect of it kind of dwindles a little bit, they'll still be pretty satisfied. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really great things to be taken from that. Well, Beth, we're we're at 30 minutes. I told you this is going to go really fast, which yep. it did. Your insight in this is absolutely tremendous. How can people find you real quickly before we we sign off here? What's the best way to contact you? Email me is fine. You can go on our website, which is prosperiogroup.com. You can email me at beth.carol, two R's, two L's, at Prosperio Group. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. On my website, actually, there's a booking link. So if you want to schedule time with me, go on the website, find the booking link, and it'll show you my availability. And you can just book a 30-minute spot for us to just have a chat. And of course, you're on LinkedIn and they can go to Amazon and find your book, Taming the Compensation Monster, which I have. I haven't read it all the way through yet, but I started. It's great. I'm very excited about that because I love like I've, I've kind of been informally trained about this and now I want to be a little bit more formally trained. So thank you so much for that. And for everybody else, thank you for watching the show. We're going to be right back here tomorrow at 1030 a.m. with Joshua Harrison, who is an extreme endurance athlete. You're not going to want to miss this. Uh, uh, show. It's going to be really great to talk about the mindset of endurance athletes. Um, and we'll have great shows the rest of the week. So Beth, thanks so much for your time. Hope you'll come back and join us. And I hope the rest of you have an absolutely wonderful afternoon. We'll see you guys real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.